Since I drifted out in sin, had no hope, no peace within, and my soul was burdened down with pride. But then Jesus came along, and he showed me I was wrong, and then he placed me on the winning side. Well, Since I gave him full control, and now I know I'm on the winning side. Well, I tonight turn to page 67 what a day that will be let's stand together sing both verses of page 67 if you need it what a day that will be
turn around and shake hands, smile and wave at somebody if you're not able to shake hands as our pastor comes. Amen. What a day that will be. We were just talking about it before church tonight. He promised, and what he promised he will do. It's good to see you in the house of God tonight on this rainy Wednesday night. Boy, we had a real storm over here a while ago, but it simmered down a little bit where people can come to church. We appreciate it, and I don't know what they got downstairs, but pray for the uh, workers down there and the children, and pray for this coming weekend when we get together in Sunday school and preaching again. Pray for the services, all the services. But we welcome you. If you're here for the first time, lift up your hand. The ushers will bring you a card. Fill it out and drop it in the offering bag when it passes by. And then uh, Sunday school, Sunday morning, 10 o'clock, preaching at 11. But we're going to be electing uh, officers and teachers in the service also. It won't take but just a few minutes. And then we're looking out three deacons. So be praying about that. And then our Jubilee coming up August 17th through the 22nd. And it'll start on that Sunday night at 6.30 with Cody Zorn, and he'll preach through Tuesday night, and then Joe Arthur will take over Wednesday night through Friday night. And so you pray and tell others about it, invite them to come. We just had two requests to come in, Jason Pritchett and then the Jeter family. And then we're going to read this uh, prayer list off. You remember some of these if you can. Jeremy and Jennifer Wakefield, Ann K., Johnny Hembry, Nicholas Papala, Danny Black, Danny Trull, Rita Cantrell. Good to have you over there, buddy. Praise the Lord. You've come a long way. Sure have. And Rita Cantrell, uh, Brenda Alexander, uh, Paige Huff, Carol Clark, Crystal Burnett, Edwin Kay, Loretta Fowler, Roy Pettit, Kathy Pettit, Butch McCombs, Zelda Bishop, D. Hall, Mike Haney, Sybil Kelly, David Swanger, Walter Brookshire, Scott Wakefield, Elizabeth Holcomb, Eunice Pridmore, Jim Harless, Mary Baker, Rebecca Runyon, uh, Leon, Leonard Pulley, Jimmy Thompson, Carol Sinner, Mary Dan Kay, Sidney Kleiman, Eric Stevens, Catherine Davis, Heather McKinney, Judy Moody, and Jack Thomas. All right, ushers, you come. We'll receive an offering. You give whatever the Lord lays upon your heart. Amen. Good to be in the house of God, isn't it? Yeah. Amen. Brother Jack Roberts, lead us in a word of prayer. Our Father, Lord, we thank you again now for giving us one more opportunity to come back into your house and worship you in spirit and truth, Lord. We just uh, focus on the service tonight now. We just ask, Lord, that you'd bless our pastor as he comes in a few minutes, Lord. Just give him what you'd have him preach to us. Then bless Brother Sammy and our choir and our musicians, Father, as they sing for your glory. Then, Lord, this long prayer list our pastor just read off. We just ask, Lord, that you minister to each and every one and just do for them that needs to be done in accordance to your will, and we'll thank you for that. Be with our little folks downstairs, Lord, and bless them. We just want to thank you again now for all your blessings. We thank you especially for the shower of rain you sent us a few minutes ago, Lord. We can't praise you enough for what you've done for us. Thank you now for what we're about to receive. Just bless the gift and the giver, and we'll praise you again and again for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
in our world today. So scary. I'm so glad I can always trust in him. a traveler I was one dream down a road rough and dusty Satan he had me blinded to the things of the Lord I didn't know the peace of Jesus I was unaware salvation Till I trusted in him completely by reading God's word. Oh, how sweet to rest in the arms of Jesus. Oh, how sweet to know I'm saved.
Jesus, please come fast. Lazarus is sick, and without your help, he will not last. Mary and Martha, watch their brother die. They waited for Jesus. He did not come, and they wondered why. The death watch was over, buried for days. Somebody said, he'll soon be here. The Lord's on his way. Martha ran to him. And she cried, Lord, if you had been here, you could have healed him. He'd still be alive. But you're four days late, and all hope is gone. Lord, we don't understand why you waited so long. said Martha show me the grave but she said Lord you don't understand he's been there four days the gravestone was rolled back then Jesus cried Lazarus come forth and somebody said he's alive, he's alive. You may be fighting a battle of fear. You've cried to the Lord, I need you now, but he has not appeared. Friend, don't be discouraged, cause he's still the same. He'll soon be here, he'll roll back the stone, and he'll call out your name when he's four days late, and all hope is gone, and you don't. There it is. Gotcha. Yeah, I had it right there before. I don't know what happened. But anyway, uh, God's good, isn't he? I'm glad to be in the house of God tonight.
Testing one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. <laughs> a little boy asked his mama, said, how come singers can't count? She said, what do you mean? They always say I'm testing one, two, one, two, one, two. <laughs> All right. Now let's turn to Matthew chapter number 11. Matthew chapter number 11. This is on page uh, 1010. 1010, uh, verse number 19. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Behold, a man gluttonous, and a, a wine bibber. Now, now underline this, a friend of publicans and sinners, but wisdom is justified of her children. I want to talk just a little bit tonight and praise the Lord and say that Jesus is the best friend a sinner ever had. My friend, whenever we meditate upon this fact and these facts that we have in the inspired Word of God, our sinfulness comes before us. We realize how uh, really sinful we are and have been. We realize how ungodly we've been in this life in many ways. And how could we deserve a friend like the Holy Son of God? How could that be true that Jesus would love even me and be my friend? Not only my Savior, but my friend. Now, he's perfectly holy. He had no sin at all. He is the mighty creator. I stood at the door a while ago and watched the storm uh, as, it, as the rain came down and changed directions three or four times. And I thought about, oh, Lord, my God, how great thou art. I see the stars and I hear the rolling thunder. That thunder was loud. And, brother, I stood there and just praised the Lord for his power. Because, you know, he may, he may not have sent that storm. I don't know. But he allowed it to come. And I tell you, if he didn't want it to come, it could not have come. It's all in the hand of God. So he is all-powerful, all-knowing, all-wise, and always the same, immutable, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Man is the opposite of all of that. Man, of course, is powerless and ignorant and foolish and inconsistent in so many ways. Most of them are, especially in our day and hour. We see that every day. Yet the Bible claims that Jesus is the best friend that a sinner has ever had. And I want to say amen and amen and amen to that because I know that in my heart tonight. Evil men noticed the friendship of Jesus, how that he uh, went to them and brought them in and sat down with them and talked with them and fellowship with them. Not with sin now, but with sinners. He did not okay one sin at all in any way. He was sinless. And he never tried to okay any of their sins. But he was there helping them to hear the truth so they could be saved from sin. And so people have falsely accused Jesus when he was here on this earth. They uh, falsely accuse him now. But he is the spotless Son of God. And yet he's your friend. And he's my friend. Now evil men recognized that kindness and that affection that Jesus showed to sinners. And they said, Behold, a man gluttonous and a wine bibber. Now, gluttonous means riotous living, like the prodigal son when he left home from his father's house and went into the world and spent all of his money in riotous living, living and found himself in the hog pen, feeding swine, and longing to go back to the father. Well, that was right as living. They are accusing and bringing Jesus down on that level. And then they said a wine bibber, which means a habitual drinker of wine, and it's about calling him a drunk. Look at the terrible things that they associated with the Lord Jesus Christ. They misjudged his character for sure, but they were right about one thing. He's a friend to sinners. Now, they didn't mean that in a complimentary way. 
They didn't mean that in a real good way that Jesus is so sweet and so good and so gracious toward sinners that He'd be their friend. They're trying to make fun. They're trying to uh, make Him look bad in the eyes of their peers. Now, Jesus is a friend, and I will say that. He is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Over in Proverbs 18 and verse 24, a man that hath friends must show himself friendly. And there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. You know, I had three brothers, and we were very close. We grew up together, and we were really close. And, and you know, we loved each other. And, and, you know, we had those family fights and things like that. But when it came down to the nitty-gritty, we really did love each other. And anybody that knew me and my brothers knew that we had love one for another. And we stuck together wherever we were. We stuck together. If we went somewhere and we were together and I'm somebody tried to start some kind of trouble, we got together. We got together to resist whatever was trying to come against us. And so, my friend, that was good to have a brother or two brothers or three brothers, four of you. Boy, that really made a strong defense. Now, this friend stays true in all troubles and all trials. Nobody keeps as close to you and me as Jesus does, as close as your brother is, as close as your sister is, as close as your mama is. Nobody has ever been as close to you as Jesus is. Nobody ever loved you like Jesus loves you. In Proverbs 17, 17, a friend loveth at all times. Well, you know about that. My friend, if you're a real friend, you love all the time. Now, in Scripture, the friend of the king was a high court official, probably the king's confidential advisor in Genesis 26 and 1 Kings chapter 4. Now, the friend of God is a title given to Father Abraham because of Abraham's close relations with the, God, with the true and living God and his faithfulness to that God. He believed God. He trusted God. He obeyed God. He did whatever God instructed him to do. So the word friend was used as a general salutation, whether to friend or foe. A good illustration of what I mean there is in Matthew chapter 26 and verse number 50. And Jesus said unto him, Judas, said unto Judas his carrot, friend, called Judas friend, wherefore art thou come? Now Judas kissed Jesus, and they took Jesus away. In James 4, 4, the Bible says, The friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is an enemy to God. Jesus sticks closer to us than any brother. And Jesus will stick with us till the storms of life are all gone by. He is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. But not only that, he is a friend that loveth at all times, according to that Proverbs 17:17. 17, 17. In Romans 5, 8, the Bible says, God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In John 15, 13, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And he said, Ye are my friends, if you do whatsoever I command you. John 17 and verse 26, I have declared unto them thy name, this is his prayer to the Father, he said thy name and will declare it, that the love, the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them and I in them. You know whenever we were lost and undone, we didn't have much love for people. I mean generally we just didn't love people with a real love. We loved our mama, we loved our daddy, we loved our brothers and sisters, things like that. But we didn't have a love for everybody. The populace just didn't give us anything. But you know, it was strange. As soon as we got saved, as soon as we got born again, all of a sudden we're loving people. And I mean, we didn't do it. We didn't do it. I didn't try. I didn't work at it. I didn't strain at it. I didn't say, now look, i got to love everybody. And I'm going to work at this until I can accomplish that. It was already there. The very second Jesus came in, love came in. And instead of hating people, I started loving people. And brother, it was just automatic, you might say. So that's a work of the grace of God. You and I that are saved by the grace of God, we love each other. And I've heard people that claim to be saved say, I hate him. 
or I hate her. You don't know what you're saying. You know what you sound like. Sounds like to me you need a good dose of old time, born again salvation. Because if the Holy Ghost is in you, you can't hate anybody. Now you may hate their ways, and boy, there are plenty of people like that that I hate today. I hate their ways, but I don't hate anybody. I'd like to see that crowd in Washington, D.C. get saved. Wouldn't it be good if several of them got saved, started testifying for the Lord Jesus Christ? But over in Romans chapter 8 and verse 38, for I am persuaded, Paul said, he said, neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That love that came in when we got saved, how, how long have you been saved? 40 years, 30 years, 50 years, whatever. Many of us have been saved a bunch of years. But you know that love's never left? It came in <coughs> the first day, <coughs> the first night we got saved. And it hasn't left. It is still with us. As a matter of fact, it's more intense now than it's ever been. I really do love you people. I love Truth Missionary Baptist Church better than I love me. And that's the God's truth. God hears me talking. He knows I love this church. He knows I love every member of this church. Now, I mean, you know, hey, everybody's different. Many people have this habit, that habit, that problem, that problem. But we still love no matter what goes on. Now, Romans chapter 5, verse 5, the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. 2 Corinthians 13, 11, be perfect, be good. He said, be of good comfort, be of one mind, live in peace, and the God of love and peace shall be with you. That's a promise. God is with us tonight. In the midst of all this turmoil in America, God's still with us. Yeah, don't be afraid. I got a message coming up pretty soon. And I think that'll encourage you to just keep on going like we're going, preaching the Word of God. Didn't I say something about it Sunday? I think I meant to. I'm telling you, God called me to preach this book, to preach this Word. He didn't call me to get out there and raise hell and do all kind of other filthy things. He didn't even call me, call me to go out there. Now, I, I have preached on the street now. I preached in jails and nursing homes and uh, uh, on the street and in the park. I preached just about everywhere you can name, but I preached the gospel. I didn't go to march. I didn't go to raise Cain and turn up, pass up something up and get people stirred up in the flesh. I didn't do that, but I did go and preach God's Word where I felt I needed to do so. I remember the time Jesus Christ Superstar came to the Memorial Auditorium. You've heard me tell this, and I called Mr. Timms that was over the Memorial Auditorium, and I said, look, don't bring Jesus Christ Superstar to Greenville. He said, why? I said, because it's a devil. It's of the devil. It's blasphemous. And he said, well, I'm a public servant. I have to do what they tell me to do. And I said, well, brother, if you are saved, you won't bring that thing here. He said, I'm as good a Christian as you are. I said, not if you bring Jesus Christ Superstar here, you're not. Not as good as I am. He said, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have him. I'm going to have it here. And I said, all right. I'm going to get on the radio every day. I was on WBBR. I said, I'm going to get on WBBR every day at 11 o'clock. And I'm going to tell everybody that will listen to me, Jesus Christ Superstar is damnable. It's of the devil. It's not of God. It dishonors Jesus. And so you don't need to go to the Memorial Auditorium and watch that thing or to see that thing. You don't need to be there. I did that every day. And I told him, I said, and by the way, on that day you bring it, if you still bring it, I'm going to be in front of the Memorial Auditorium preaching. And he said, uh, well, you just don't, don't, don't bother me. Don't, don't do anything that I don't want. Or he went on running off at the mouth. So I got on the radio. And every day I plugged, I tell you, I told everybody what a, an awful thing that was. And then on that uh, Sunday or whatever it was that it came, I believe it was on a Sunday, it came and uh, I and some Bob Jones students and Tabernacle students and Brother Ansel Pruitt at First Baptist at City View and Roger Cotts over at uh, one of the churches, Summit View, and different ones, we got together. We went up in front of the Memorial Auditorium, and I started preaching. I started preaching, and young people, teenagers, were coming and gathering around. 
And some of them began to ask me, what's wrong with it? What's wrong with it? I said, read the lyrics. Just read the lyrics. You'll see what's wrong with it. Well, they stood there listening to me preach. <coughs> and uh, Mr. Timms came out and said, you get out of here. And he put his hand on my chest. And an old boy from Mississippi, studying for the minister, by the way, but he had hands about the biggest two of mine. And he was a long, tall, talking kind of guy. He walked up Mr. Tim and said, get your hand off of that preacher. Or I'll knock your teeth down your throat. <laughs> Mr. Tim's backed off. Well, Jimmy Jennings, y'all remember him? He's in heaven now. Oh, Jimmy Jennings was one of my converts, one of my preacher boys. Dave Partridge came and stuck a camera in his face, and Jimmy just took his Bible and made him swallow that cam camera. And uh, the cop grabbed Jimmy, and he said, you're going to jail. I said, wait a minute, he's with me. He said, well, can you handle him? I said, oh, yeah, I can handle him. And so the cop let me have him. I said, Jimmy, don't hit anybody with your Bible or anything. He said, that's what I thought you wanted me to do. <laughs> Boy, we had it going up there. Well, in a little bit, I heard the sirens coming. Mr. Timms went in and called the police. I heard them coming. Chief Norris was chief of Greenville, and they pulled up right behind me at the curb, and I'm standing here, and Chief Norris st stepped out of the back seat of that car. He stood there and listened to me preach a little while. And he said to Roger Cox, said, who is that preacher? He told him, he said, well, tell him not to block their entrance, but tell him to give it to them. He got in his car and left. <laughs> well, the next day, it came out in the news that Jesus Christ Superstar, after 28 showings, lost money the first time in Greenville, South Carolina. I was so proud of that. We didn't keep them all out of there, but we got a lot of them away from that. And I don't know, I don't know if he'll ever or if anybody will ever have it. Somebody else may have it. I don't know. But I'm telling you right now, I couldn't stand them blaspheming my Savior like that, and I not open my mouth. And I had a lot of backing on that, and I appreciated those that backed me. Because, see, Jesus is my friend. Jesus is not only my Savior, he's my friend. And I tell you, a friend is something, brother, you can, uh, you can put some value on. Any friend is valuable but especially Jesus. So he's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. He's a friend that loveth at all times. And then he is a friend that is always faithful. In Psalm 36 and verse 5, Thy mercy, O Lord, is in the heavens, and thy faithfulness reacheth unto the clouds. Psalm 89, 1, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness unto all generations. Listen, I will sing. The James tells us, is any merry? Sing. Sing songs. The Bible's full of music. God invented music. Man polluted music. God made us to sing. I'm sitting there on that pew every service, and that choir starts singing, Sunday especially, Sunday morning. As soon as that first note sounded, I felt the Spirit. Brother, listen, and I sang along with the choir. Now, I don't claim to be a great singer or anything like that, but I, I've got a song in my heart. I want to sing praises unto him. The psalmist said, I will sing praises unto him. I will make known, he said. So we can't keep our joy and our gladness from other people. You just can't do it. People notice it. They may criticize it. They may curse it. They may say we're a bunch of crazy fools, and they do. But they notice something is going on. They know I've got a friend that they don't have, and they're trying to belittle him because he is such a friend. So we have to tell somebody. If you get filled with the Holy Ghost, and my friend, that's not some gigantic thing that it, you have to strain at to get. It's something you just yield to in a simple way, faith, and he'll fill you and bless you, and you'll have grace, and you'll have courage, and you'll be able to talk about your Savior. So the psalmist speaks of God's mercies <clears throat> and his faithfulness. Now, we all realize tonight that we are truly recipients of God's mercy. You know, we could have died before we heard the gospel. We could have been killed in some of those awful things that we were involved in before we got saved. We'd be in hell tonight. But the mercy of God kept back those terrible tragedies of a soul going to hell he kept back those things from us until we heard the gospel, the glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
until we saw the truth in the message of the gospel of the Lord Jesus, until we saw the light of the glorious gospel, and until we experienced the power of the glorious gospel. All of that came to us in Isaiah 55, 3, Incline your ear and come unto me. Here and your soul shall live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you. You know, we talked the other day about everything God does is everlasting. We get your everlasting life when we get saved. We're saved forever and forever and forever and forever, and we'll never be lost. So even the sure mercies of David are given to us, and David is certainly a great example of God's mercy, of His grace, and of His faithfulness. Even though David sinned greatly, paid for it, prayed for it up till the day he died paid for his sin, but David was humble enough to bow before God and call out to God for forgiveness, and then for God to restore unto him the joy of God's salvation. Now, I tell you, if you ever backslide on God, you're miserable. I never have gone back into drinking and cursing and carousing and all that. I never have done that. But there have been times in my life and in my ministry that I didn't feel good. I didn't feel like I was doing all I could do for God. I felt like I'd backslidden in my heart. And I was miserable just doing that, just being cold. And I had to get on that altar. I had to get down and start talking to my God. I want that joy. I want that joy. I got that joy tonight. What about it? You got the joy, joy, joy down in your heart? Well, praise God for it. Don't lose that joy. If you lose it, get it back. You can't lose your salvation, but you can lose your joy of that great salvation. Psalm 89, 2, he said, For I have said, Mercy shall be built up forever. Thy faithfulness shall thou establish in the very heavens. He's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother, a friend that loveth at all times, a friend that is always faithful, and then he's a friend that giveth perfect counsel. And I love this. I love this. In Psalm 33, 11, The counsel of the Lord standeth forever. So, hey, this is God's counsel. And whenever I read it, I don't have to worry about it ever changing. I don't have to worry about, now, that's what it said today, but what will it say tomorrow? What about some man changing this verse to something else? Then I won't have that. Don't worry about, hold on to this Word of God. It'll be the same when we get to heaven. It'll never change. So, my friend, he said, the counsel of the Lord standeth forever, the thoughts of his heart to all generations. Now, we see the immutability of our God when we read verses like this. How can we know God's thoughts? God's thoughts are above everything. But how can I know them? By the Word of God. That's the only way you'll ever know the thoughts of God is to read His Word. And then you begin to know the thoughts of God, what God thought, what God thinks, and what God is going to think tomorrow. He's the same. So, my friend, the thoughts of his heart are eternal, just like he is. Now, many friends in our day, and you probably had some of these, they are fair-weather friends, or they friends. Some of them stick for a long time. Then all of a sudden, things happen in their life that they begin to turn. And, boy, that breaks your heart. I've had friends that would hug my neck, hug my neck. I've had men. I had one man here some years ago. Every service, every service, he made sure he came to me wherever I was and hugged my neck and said, Pastor, I love you. And then all of a sudden, he became a bitter enemy, and I don't know why. I don't know to this day why he changed so drastically. But I don't have to worry about Jesus doing that. Ha, <laughs> ha, glory. Yeah, you may turn on me. You may turn against me. You may say, I want you out of here. That's all right, but you can't take Jesus away from me, and he won't leave me. For anybody. He's not going to be influenced by anybody to let old Sammy K go. I had a time getting it, but I got him and I'm going to keep him. Amen. I was one of them you could throw back probably, but he didn't. He didn't throw me back. He killed me. And so, my friend, many friends are failures and they're not real, real friends that love at all times. In Psalm 33 12, the Bible says, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord and the people whom he hath chosen for his own inheritance. Man's thoughts many times are vain, many times. God's thoughts are never vain. They're always beneficial to all his people all of the time. His words are our counsel now. 
And if you want to know how to be counseled, here it is. You got it in your lap right there. Make it important to your life. My friend, his words are our counsel, and that means perfect counsel all the time. No flaw, no mistake. You go to a psychiatrist or a psychologist or even a preacher sometime. They'll tell you what they know or what they think, and sometimes if they write, they'll read the Word of God to you, then that gives you the truth. But sometimes just giving an opinion doesn't, doesn't get it. It just doesn't get it because they could be wrong. And I'm telling many of them are wrong, way off. As we were talking before church about the different cults, the different cults and how they believe, what they believe, and how sinful it is and how ungodly it is what they believe. Well, brother, you and I don't have to worry about it. We've got the truth. We've got God's promise. I said, you know, I don't know when Russia is going to get together with those allies and come down to take Israel, but I, I wouldn't mind being here on this earth when that takes place. I'd like to see God destroy that great big army and leave just a sixth part of them. Now, I don't know if that's going to take place right before the rapture or after the rapture. That's just not plain enough, but it's going to happen. It's going to happen. God's going to intervene when, Ru when, when Russia and that crowd come down to get Israel. Now, they, they want Afghanistan. Afghanistan is wealthy. And, brother, this thing's building right now. It's building for somebody to move. Greed causes people to move. and causes them to go after something they don't have. I told Sammy the other day, as long as you have something that somebody else wants, you're ahead of the game. But when you lack something that somebody has, you're behind in the game. So don't let people talk you out of something that you have that's valuable. Weigh it out. I mean, if you're going to sell something, well, make sure you know what you're doing. Don't just up and sell something and say, oh, I wish they hadn't gotten rid of that. Use your mind. Use your head. Think these things through. So there is, of course, these awful people that are, are living like that, that are greedy, and they're going to come after Israel, but God will have to intervene. Naturally speaking, Israel could not survive all of those armies that are going to join together. Russia, Iraq, Iran, Turkey, uh, uh, Germany, other, other uh, nations, they're going to all get together in, in, in an alliance, and they're going to come after Israel, little old Israel. But you know, Israel is not going to be destroyed. God's going to intervene. And God's going to destroy all but a sixth part. And you know why God's going to do that? God said, so they'll know that I'm the Lord. They're going to know he's God. They, they won't recognize him now, but I tell you what, they're going to recognize him before long. Yes, sir, this whole world's going to recognize him. He's God. He's your God. He's my God. And, you, and he's not going to let us down. He's going to keep us through all these storms until we reach heaven's bright shore safely. Proverbs 125, there are people out there that they really don't want to hear God's counsel. They uh, reject God's counsel. They despise God's counsel. They count it as nothing. Listen to what God said in Proverbs 125. You have said it naught. That means you count it as nothing. All my counsel. Evil men, they have counted God's counsel as nothing. And he said, and would none of my reproof. But he said, I'll laugh. When your calamity comes, I'll mock when your fear cometh. That's what God said now. All right, evil men out there, you think you're smart, you think you're getting by, go right ahead. The day will come when God will laugh in your face and show you what a fool you've been, and you're going to be shaking in your boots. He said when your calamity comes and when your fear comes, you know, fear hath torment. And you know, it's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living God. And when they get to that point, they're going to cry out, but God's not even going to hear. He's not going to listen. It's going to be too late. My, I'm glad I've got the counsel. I'm glad I received his counsel. I receive it every day that I live. I read this Bible every day that I live, and I get my strength through that. So, a brother, and i got to close here, a friend that sticketh closer than a brother, loveth at all times, always faithful, and giveth perfect counsel. And then he's a friend in closing, that transforms. John 1, 11, as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. And brother, listen, one moment you're a child of the devil. The next moment you're a child of God. Is that not transformation? My friend, that's what it is. 
So the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to all that believe. Transform means to convert, to change, to make better. This friend can take the morally good or the morally bad, doesn't make any difference to him whether they're morally good or morally bad, and transform them <coughs> into something they've never been before, a real saint of God. There is that initial transformation at the new birth. When we got saved, just in a moment, we were transformed from a sinner to a saint. It took place in an instant, but we didn't have a lot of knowledge. We didn't know all about the Bible. We didn't know all about our Savior. We knew that we were blind, but now we see. But we didn't know all about Jesus. But there is that progressive transformation. Romans 12, 1 and 2, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The best friend a sinner ever had <coughs> is Jesus Christ. The Son of Man came, and they said he was a glutton, that he was a drunk, but he, they did say he was a friend of sinners. They got that right. They didn't mean to get it right. They got it right. You know, the devil tells us, you just alone. You don't have many people. There's so many people out there, many enemies. And I was reminded what uh, Martin Luther said one time. They said, sir, the world is against you. He said, I'm against the world. I like those apples. The world may be against us, but we're against the world. And we're not going to give in to the world. We're not going to give in to the flesh or the devil. We're going to stand for this friend, a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Let's stand on our feet. Is he your friend tonight? <coughs> if not, you need to let your heart be turned open. I mean, open it up. Let Jesus come in. Let Jesus come in. He's the one and only one that can keep you happy and make you victorious in your everyday life. And you don't have to let the circumstances, the news reels, all that trouble you, bother you, keep you awake at night. Huh. Don't worry about it. God's got everything. Uh, he's got it all mapped out. It's coming. And we're going to be gone one of these days pretty soon. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for this time together on this rainy night. I pray you'll bless this church. Bless us this coming Lord's Day. Lord, let us get uh, blessing after blessing and give glory to God. We love you, Father. We love you for being our friend, and we are your friend. We love you from the depths of our heart, Lord. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you. We'll see you Sunday morning at 10 o'clock.